Is divine health a guaranteed promise for Christians? Get your Bible out as we dig into the scriptures today. You're having coffee with Conrad on... Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. And you know my passion is for you, yes, you... To have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Now, I'm just going to come right out and say it. I believe that part of having that spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus implies that maybe we should be walking in divine health. But today, we're going to take a deep dive and we're going to look into it with scripture. Today, I'm going to examine some popular verses used to support concepts like guaranteed healing, walking in divine health, and freedom from all sickness. But does the Bible really confirm these ideas when we look at the full context? Get ready for a deep yet balanced look at divine healing versus living in a fallen world. In the end, you'll walk away better informed and equipped to pray for healing according to God's will. So grab your coffee. Let's see what the Word of God says on this important topic. This is Conrad inviting you into scriptural truth and spiritual growth here on Coffee with Conrad. We are having coffee with Conrad at ConradRocks.net. So divine health. Should Christians walk in divine health? So before we get into this, we need to have divine health defined. When you're talking to Christians about walking in divine health, what do they mean? And Christians often use the phrase, this is from my personal experience, walking in divine health, to refer to a life of physical, mental, spiritual well-being that reflects God's promises of health and healing found in Scripture. When they talk about it, it, it's like you look at their face And they're thinking about some scripture, and we're going to dig into what some of those are today. And this walking in divine health includes the belief that believers can access healing through prayer, faith, and obedience to God's Word. Generally, it means that Christians should strive for optimal health, both physically and spiritually. In short, walking in divine health is about living a life that reflects the promises of God's Word, a life of physical wellness emotional healing, and spiritual growth. So I really want to get into the listener comments. I have some great comments on Facebook, but let's let's dig into some scriptures first that you get just like from going into the Bible. Let's examine them and see if they really talk about walking in divine health. Is this a promise that Christians can really hold on to? Now, I'm not going to play the Ace of Spades last <laughs> because... This is one here that I think that we need to deal with. This is a post-cross scripture. In other words, it's after Jesus has died and been resurrected. It's part of the New Testament. This is not pre-cross Old Testament. This is definitely New Testament. And this is Paul talking to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven through 30, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, when I think about this, we have to realize that Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church here. He's talking to a body of believers. But then, just like Jesus says, whosoever does these words and keeps them, I'll liken him to a wise man. You know that passage? Well, Paul says, whosoever, you know, wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily. So my thought here is there can be someone inside the Corinthian church This goes, you know, I'm just going to take communion. You know, that's what we think it is. They were basically just having dinner. You know, they would eat bread from house to house daily. That's what the early church did before what we have going on today. 
you think here that Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He is writing to the Corinthian church. But this whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, it could be an unbeliever. You know, th- this is called taking the name of the Lord in vain. It's calling yourself a Christian and not being one. This is a possible interpretation. Okay, that's one I'm putting on the table. Or it could just be somebody who's steeped in sin, kind of like the fornicator in the Corinthian, you know, this in this letter, the first Corinthian letter. That's a possibility. Okay, but this is someone who's taking communion or, you know, basically they were eating bread from house to house daily. That's what they were doing before what we have today. But here he's saying, if you're going to do this, you need to examine yourself and then eat that bread and drink of that cup. Okay, for he that, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, that's what we got to figure out, right? What is, we're going to walk in divine health. We need to know what eating and drinking the cup of Christ unworthily is. We need to know what that is, because if you do it, you're eating and drinking damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, he's saying this is exactly why people are sick and dying among you, meaning among the Corinthian church. So this is something that we need to uh, delve into. This is like the ace of spades scripture here that we have to deal with. We have to wrestle with this and see what this means as far as Christians walking in divine health. Okay, here's another scripture, and this has to do with the passage with the parable of the unforgiving servant. And we find this in Matthew 18. I'm not going to read the whole parable. I'm assuming if you follow my podcast, you're already familiar with the parable. But I am going to focus on the last part of it. This is where Jesus says in Matthew 18, 32, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Now, verse 34, And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Now, obviously, this is how not to walk in divine health. We're going to get into some some other scriptures about that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and just say, yes, I understand this is a pre-cross verse, but this really does agree with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and I read that earlier, that a man should examine himself. You know, we need to look into our hearts, because if you eat that bread and drink that cup unworthily, you're drinking damnation to yourself. And then Paul says very clearly, This is why many of you in the Corinthian church, these are Christians, are sick. Now, I want to point out that Jesus is speaking specifically to his disciples. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, disciples of Jesus. That's who he's talking to. If you, from your hearts, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Now, another thing I'm going to admit is I get a lot of flack when I talk about this, but there's a lot of scriptures that tie in a sin-sickness correlation, and I've done more than one show on it. However, uh, people get really angry <laughs> when you start talking about that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and appeal to scripture throughout the show. Um, but torment here can be sickness. Now, not only do I get that from the scriptures, I also see it in action. We've been out with Gary Nesbitt many times. I've interviewed him many times on my show, and we've seen people get radically healed right then and there when Gary's talking to them, and then they confess and repent of unforgiveness. So when they get healed, they get healed because they confess and repent of unforgiveness. And you want to have some fun, go look at some of Gary Nesbitt's video testimonies. He goes out and about, he ministers to people, he sees that they have a sickness or an ailment, he prays for them. But he also counsels them, like, what's going on? And you know what's really interesting? The Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit will show you what's going on. And you'll go, oh, I need to repent of this. And I guess Gary's a catalyst for that to happen or something. But as soon as they confess and repent, they get healed. And then he gets their video testimony right then and there. So now how does this promote the idea of walking in divine health? 
Well, it isn't very clear, but it does tie that if you want to walk in divine health, maybe forgiving people is a good idea. Unforgiveness, clearly to me, from my scripture reading and also from what I've seen, you know, my experiential theology, where I've actually experienced this theology, is it's a bad idea to not forgive people because it will, it could possibly make you sick. And here's Jesus very clearly speaking to his disciples. So I just want to drive that home. This is Janet with Overcoming Abuse God's Way. We're a ministry that loves the abused woman right back into the arms of Jesus Christ. You're having coffee with Conrad at conradrocks.net. On this portion of the podcast, I really struggled because I was looking for scriptures in the Bible all over the internet that support walking in divine health. And you're going to be hard pressed to find those, but I'm going to examine like a few of them and then I'm going to show you that all the scriptures that I found seem to have a very similar problem. They allude that you can, I mean, you can infer that, oh yeah, I can walk in divine health, but it's not explicitly stated. So we're going to examine a few of those, the most popular scriptures anyway, and I'm going to give the pros and cons for that. Now, here's one of the popular verses for walking in divine health. It comes all the way back from Exodus. And if you remember, in Exodus, when the children of Israel left Egypt, uh, it sounds like they were pretty much walking in divine health. They did, their feet didn't swell. There's some scriptures that allude to that. But here we go with Exodus 15, 26. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Notice the if there, okay? If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Now, you know, people shout at me for talking about stuff like this, but here is scripture that clearly shows that God puts diseases on people. So when we read this passage, we have to think of what Jesus says in Matthew 18 when he says, my father will turn his disciples over to the tormentors. Or when Paul says, that's why some of you are sick, you're not keeping the precepts of God here, kind of like the, his nature, character, and authority goes all the way back to Exodus 15, 26. Now, so the pros here, the pros of walking in divine health, is basically if you'll listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what's right in his eyes, then you won't get sick. So that's a really strong scripture and support, but it's not a blanket promise. Have you noticed that? It's not like this blanket, you're never going to get sick at all. I don't get that. Another verse that people like to use when it comes to walking in divine health is Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So here we see, just woven into the verse here, you're going to have afflictions. You know, Paul had the thorn in his side, and this is the apostle Paul. He was afflicted. And he said, I'm going to rather boast in mine infirmities. But here it says, the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So as far as the pro for walking in divine health, it says here the righteous are going to have some afflictions, and that could be sickness, I would infer, right? What do you think? And then, But once you're there, the Lord delivereth him out of them all. But guess what? You can tell by the context of Scripture that God will deliver you, like in Hosea 5, 15, I believe, in their affliction, they will seek me early, right? So affliction is designed to drive us to seek God. That's my perspective on it anyway. And this passage does not guarantee that the righteous won't have afflictions. It says they're going to have them, but the Lord will deliver them. All right, another passage that's used here is Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And one of the things I like to point out is it's proceedeth. It's like proceeding, not proceeded. So I I believe we have to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. And that is how we live, by walking lockstep in his rhema revelation, in, in his spirit, and in his written word. While this is a popular scripture in support of walking divine health, it still doesn't say that the righteous will never be afflicted, even if they walk 100% in the will of God. 
so I'm going to tell you, I find a lot with all the scriptures that the divine health people put forth, I find a lot of these problems. I mean, yeah, they're good scriptures, but they don't guarantee that we're never going to get sick. You know, when we look at the broader biblical narrative, we see many godly people who weren't healed or delivered from physical afflictions, like Paul's thorn in the flesh, for example, if you're going to call that a sickness. It does say a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, but that's an affliction. Epaphroditus's illness, Timothy's frequent stomach ailments, and Trophimus, which was a Christian, he was being left sick as well. So these are Christians, and I don't know what their stance is, but they're in the Bible. Should they have got sick? So, you know, this is beginning to make me question. I mean, I was holding on to the belief that Christians should not get sick if they're walking in the will of God. That's what I was thinking. So while God can and does heal at times according to his will, the Bible does not support the idea of a guaranteed divine health based on our faith or on our obedience. Our physical bodies seem to remain mortal and vulnerable to illness, aging, and the effects of living in a fallen world. I mean, I could go on and on about scriptures that are used as proof texts for divine health, but they all seem to have this problem. The theology overpromises what the scriptures actually say. But you know what I'm going to do for the sake of, uh, of brevity? I'm going to go ahead and put a lot of the, the references in the notes so that you can read them for yourself and see if you come up with the same conclusion. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some of my personal experiences, and then I'm going to get into some of the Facebook and listener comments. But I want to tell you, I talk about experiential theology. I like to not only know the scriptures, but I also like to see when they apply to my life, when I walk through them or when I experience them, then you really get this full understanding of what they mean. So when I say uh, there's things like a sin-sickness correlation, you know, and, and people seem to get upset. I'm telling you that I'm being sincere. I mean, I could be sincerely wrong. People can be sincere and still be wrong. But I've experienced a lot of this. I've seen it happen firsthand. And the scriptures do agree. Um, I've talked to people about this several times. It's not something that we want to be true. But however, you got to read the Bible for what it says. We have to seek the truth for ourselves rather than shoring up our belief system and trying to find scriptures to to prove that we're right. We need to submit to the word and will of God. So here's a couple of things. You know, one time I was going to do some ministry and someone called me on the phone and said, I need help doing this certain thing. And without praying about it, without thinking about it, I just went ahead and agreed to do this. And Basically, it was going to interfere with the ministry that we had already planned, right? So that's the thing for God. And here I am making an agreement that I shouldn't have made. And within that minute, I had two pains come up upon me, two pains immediately. And deep down spiritually, when I made this agreement, um, I kind of knew I probably should stop and pray about it. But I thought, oh, no, I can. I, my, my higher level consciousness says, oh, no, I can take care of this. It's not going to be that big of a deal. It'll just take a few minutes, blah, blah, blah. And then I had two pains come on me, man, right away. It was so bad that I couldn't even hardly walk. I, we were getting out of the car, and I couldn't even walk to Coles. I mean, Susan's like, what's wrong with you, man? I was like, I had a hard time walking. And it took me till about 2 or 3 in the morning in prayer. The Lord was showing me, highlighting that I made an agreement without checking with him. And it's kind of like how Joshua made an agreement with the Gibeonites. They acted like they were coming from a far country, and he didn't even bother to pray about it. And therefore, the Gibeonites became a thorn in his side. So around two or three in the morning, I was praying about it, and the Lord highlighted to my remembrance that I made that covenant without checking with him. And then I cast those two pains out. I had to cast out both of them. I said, get out in the name of Jesus. Now, this will cook your theology because I'm a Christian, right? But I'm saying this is what I experienced, and this is the tormentors that God can put on you, right? So don't shout me down, right? This is what happened. Uh, and then I could walk immediately. I was fine. So that's one thing about uh, walking in divine health. 
you can walk out a cup and you can mess up and make a, a, a mistake like that. And that's what happened to me. Paul had the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan above him. Speaking of getting sick another time, uh, we, we tried to buy houses in you know the last 10 years without praying about it. It just seemed like, oh, that's the normal thing to do. You know, you want to pay to our mortgage instead of rent. But God, we didn't check with God. <laughs> and, and each time we tried to buy a house, we both got sick. And the, the houses fell out of escrow both times. So important decisions like that, you got to pray about. I even say pray about the small ones, man, because you do want to be led by the Spirit of God. Those are the sons of God, Romans eight fourteen. You know, and another thing, I was uh, totally thinking I wasn't going to get COVID <laughs> because I was claiming Psalm 91. I was mentally convincing myself that I was under the shadow of the Almighty God, right? I'm not going to get COVID. And then I got COVID, you know, and there's a lot of other pastors that were, uh, they were arrogant and boasting, I'm not going to get sick. And they died in the media the media made sure to point that out. So we got to be humble in our walk with God. I don't want you to think by me using myself as an example here that I think that I'm some holy guy, right? Never walking in disobedience. That's not true. I mess up and I mess up quite often. You know, I struggle with certain things just like everybody else. And I think people in the Bible struggle with things too, right? And that's why we have grace, man. None of us, none of us can make it without the blood of Jesus Christ and without grace. I'm sharing this with you because this is my personal experience, and I also am, it's like experiential theology. I am marrying this with what I know of Scripture, and this is what I've found. Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey by Conrad is a must-read for those aspiring to be in the prophetic ministry or those looking to learn more about the supernatural spiritual aspect of Christianity. This book gives an intimate look at the author's experiences with astral projection, telekinesis, poltergeist, precognition, and demonic encounters before he was born again. Conrad also shares his supernatural prophetic experiences after being born again and shows you what it is like to be born again to see the kingdom of God. With plenty of scripture references and personal testimonies, this book is sure to give you the boost of confidence you need to jump into the supernatural aspect of Christianity. Get your copy of Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey today. Next, we're going to move into some Facebook comments, some listener comments, which are really good. This is from my post, Should Christians Walk in Divine Health? If so, what does that really mean? I totally appreciate my Facebook followers and my listeners because they come up with some stuff that I might not have thought of on my own, and I love to include their comments in my podcast. Let's go over a few of them. Angel Angelob says, The Word of God never promises perfect health, but promises perfect hope. So this is one that's probably done a study on their own and found, you know what, the promise of walking in divine health is much more than the Scriptures deliver, especially in full context of the whole Bible. But there's another verse, Anna Wilkerson Corman, she responds, with another popular verse for walking in divine health, which is 3 John 1, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that in every way you may succeed and prosper and be in good health physically, just as I know your soul prospers spiritually. She's probably using an amplified version there. However, we do not see that even this verse, John wants people to prosper and be in good health, but it's not guaranteed, just like angels said. Now, there's another comment here by Will Rush. He's responding to Carissa Carrasco and me, and he's talking about this interesting account of John G. Lake. Okay, he goes on to talk about how in 1910, in the midst of a plague, uh, John G. Lake was healing people, and he wasn't getting sick himself, and the government was asking him questions like, how are you getting away with this? I'm paraphrasing to make this short. This doctor asked Lake, what have you been doing to protect yourself? And Lake replied, I believe that as long as I keep my soul in contact with the living God so that his spirit is flowing into my soul and body, that no germ will ever attach itself to me, for the spirit of God will kill it. 
And then you probably know the story about how they would put diseases on John G. Lake and they would die underneath a microscope. So that's John G. Lake, <laughs> and that is a pretty famous story. But that shows how John G. Lake was walking in divine health. Notice he was doing the will of the Lord. He wasn't just sitting in the pew. He was going out and doing. Amen. Gail Russell has an interesting comment here. Where in Scripture is this concept discussed? It seems believers do get ill, or we'd not be told if there be any sick to call the elders. She's talking about that, that Scripture in James for prayer and the anointing. So this is more of a concept. This is her saying that this is more of a concept to make believers walk in guilt if they get a cold or the flu or, God forbid, cancer or diabetes. Oh, you have cancer, you must have lack of faith. You need to walk in divine health. I call balderdash. And then I kind of echoed to Gail that there's a passage about believers getting sick because they drank the cup of Christ unworthily. And here's her comment to that. Um, That too, so it seems apparent that we can and do get sick, injured, even die of sickness, disease, and injury. And then she mentions Job, you know, where God says to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? Job gets all manner of laws thrown in, on him, specifically because he's righteous and trusts his God. Can you think about that for a minute? God loved Job and let him get sick. I mean, he had boils on his skin. It's terrible, right? The advent of Messiah does not cease all illness, disease, and injury. When Holy Spirit directs, we can sometimes be party to miracles of healing. Paul is, was told his thorn in the flesh would not be removed. So God's purpose was to keep him humbled. So sickness cannot be the result of sin. I don't know if she meant to say it like that, but I I do see that. In John 5.14, Jesus finds him in the temple and says, Behold, thou art made whole. Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So Jesus right there is pretty much equating sin and sickness. Don't sin anymore. So I'm not sure if that's what she meant, but it is thought-provoking about Job there. You know, and Trish Orns caught this. Nope, Paul told Timothy to drink some wine for his bad stomach, and Paul continuously had a thorn in his side. Chris Franklin jumps in on some of the comments in that particular thread. He says, Conrad, the Bible promises healing and not divine health. I don't have solid answers why we as a church don't walk in all that was promised. In praying for the sick, I've seen miraculous healing, yes. At the same time, I've had everyone pray for me and not get healed or seen others not get healed also. Yes, my experience does not negate the promises of God. And this is why when I say earlier, my experiences are catching up with Scripture, you know, the Bible is even stronger than an eyewitness account. That's what Peter says. We have a more sure word of prophecy than even an eyewitness account, right? So just because I've had these experiences does not, you know, it. It strengthens my faith, but it doesn't mean I'm right, right? See, our experiences can't nullify what the Bible says. I even approach this subject with that in mind. Man, and here's a good comment by Mark Paul. It's very thought-provoking. He says this, There's no biblical concept of walking in divine health. If there was health that was actually divine, there would be zero sickness and zero death. I've known proponents of divine health who've had diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and death as a result of their terrible choices in lifestyle. No Christian should ever be sick, goes the rhetoric. I've known Christians who have had their loved ones hooked up to life support systems with zero brain waves and decomposing bodies who refused to concede their loved ones to death. They were speaking over and prophesying over their all but dead bodies of their loved ones until even the life support systems would fail. This is embarrassing as a Christian witness to the world. I asked such a proponent once, can we at least agree that because of the fall, every one of us will die and that when we die, it will probably be from a disease which causes our organs to fail? His answer, that's your destiny not mine. At some point, that person graduated from faith to stupid. Yeah, see, there's a point where you can get, you can get kind of crazy. And I believe that faith, you know, it's, a, it's able to quench all the fiery darts of Satan. 
When I, if I get sick, I don't want somebody to say, Lord, if it be your will, Hill Conrad, I want you to get in there and intercede for me. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, right? But there is a point where it's appointed once to die. And because of the fall, I mean, everybody dies. We're appointed once to die, right? So there's no getting out of it. And it's because of the fall of man. Death has lost its sting because we'll be resurrected. We're going to be walking with Jesus. And I also want to say I applaud people for sticking with it for faith. I mean, I'm going to be there right there with you. I'm going to be agreeing. I'm going to be finding those scriptures that speak to my mountain. And I'm going to be reminded the Lord of his word. I'm going to be doing that. And my hat is off to those people, and I agree with them. But there's a point where, you know, like he says, like Mark Paul says here at some point, you go from faith to stupid. But do you really? I mean, can I call somebody stupid for standing on what they believe? I don't know. Because I've been stupid a few times, I guess. (laughs) Now, here's an interesting comment by Lydia Matthews. Christians need to treat their body like a temple. She's obviously talking about the passage in Corinthians. Should we have a diet of junk food? If we're sick, how does that affect our ministry? Now, if you follow my podcast, I do talk about, from time to time, how God defines food. God defines food, not Kellogg's, not Walmart, not any of the food manufacturers, right? God has like three food covenants in the Bible. If you do your research, you'll notice he talks about Adam. Adam, you can eat this fruit of the tree. So Adam was a vegan, right? And then there's the, there's the fall. And then Noah starts eating meat. And then Moses comes along and God gives him restrictions. So my point is there, monosodium glutamate or folly phosphorus, whatever those ingredients are on Diet Cokes, those have never been defined by the Lord to be food. And if you do some reading on like why people get sick, you'll see it's from processed foods usually. So I'm just making a point there. You can disagree with me if you want, but I do believe that we should have a healthy diet and a biblical diet at that. So thinking about that, God laid out diets for us in the Bible. Maybe we should submit (laughs) and resist the devil, right? And Cindy Hay comes along, and she's kind of echoing this sentiment here. She says, I believe we could make better choices and change some of our own health. Original design was in the garden with God. She's talking about the diet with Adam. Nobody eats their fruits and vegetables anymore. Half of them don't even like fish. I'm not perfect, and I eat my donuts just like everybody else, but for 10 years, I've been working on rebuilding my health. I had polio when I was three, and my right side has been an irritant my whole life. The products I've been using the last 10 years, I'm walking in better health than I had since I was a little kid. Yeah, I I really think that diet has a lot to do with walking in divine health. If you eat key lime pie every day, I mean, it just makes common sense that you're going to get sick. I mean, you're going to get something, right? We should freely eat to live. That's what God told Adam. And sometimes I find myself living to eat. There's a really good comment by Teresa Diaz Grubbs. It's too long for me to put in the podcast here, but I'll talk about the first part. Christians need to walk in divine repentance. There are so many people walking in defiance against God, and they don't even know it. They're defying God with their action, their declarations, and their behavior, and the way they dress, the things they're giving praise to. How many times in a year do we say the same praises that we offer to our jealous God? Then she goes on to talking about movies and stuff like that. But I like that first line here. We need to walk in divine repentance. And a lot of us as Christians are walking in defiance against God. I get that because we're ignorant of God's ways, right? We're not supposed to be, my people perish for lack of knowledge, Hosea 4, 6. We need to know the ways of God. Yeah, in Gary Nesbitt, he says, many are the afflictions, the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. We're not guaranteed no temptation or trials, but we're guaranteed deliverance. This is interesting because later in this thread here, he's about to celebrate his third anniversary of his marriage. Now, before that, He's celebrating three years of his miracle healing. <laughs> Gary's a, an evangelist. He goes out and he prays for people that are sick. And he, he talks, I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but he'll be ministering to people and they'll remember, oh, I have unforgiveness against someone. 
he'll pray for them to repent, and then they get often get miraculously healed right in front of them, and then he gets their Facebook testimony. Well, Gary, he'd already checked into hospice. He was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. He was going to die. He got his funeral plot paid for. I mean, he was ready to go. I went down there to go say goodbye. I mean, this is how bad it was. He had this huge, huge tumor uh, on his side. He lost all this weight. And then God miraculously healed him. So I will definitely include the link to the Facebook comments in the show notes. So be sure to check them out and follow the people in the comments. While I was doing some research on this topic, I heard Pastor Bill Johnson reference Deuteronomy 8.4 and I believe 8.29 as evidence that the Israelites enjoyed supernatural divine health during their time in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy 8.4, Moses states that during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, quote, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell, unquote. Bill Johnson interprets this verse to mean that the Israelites walked in divine health and their feet miraculously did not swell despite the harsh conditions. Can you imagine the harsh conditions that the children of Israel uh, were going through during that time? He uses it to support the belief that Christians today in the New Covenant can also walk in divine health and be immune from sickness and disease. This is an encouraging idea that speaks to God's desire and power to keep his people healthy. Divine healing is promised in Scripture and exemplified in Jesus' earthly ministry is the take that Bill Johnson has on this. The con, however. Um, Using Deuteronomy 8.4 as definitive proof of guaranteed divine health, that requires some conjecture. This passage in 8.29 does not explicitly state the Israelites had perfect health, only that their feet did not swell. So we can't read more into the text than what's there. It only states that their feet did not swell and their clothes did not wear out after 40 years. But, you know, I'm thinking that they had the same shirt on (laughs) for 40 years when they left Egypt. So that's pretty cool to think about. Now, while this is remarkable, it does not mean illness was completely absent. Okay, that's not explicitly stated. The promise of divine healing in the Bible seems to be centered on God's intervention in response to prayer, and it's not a blanket guarantee of perfect health. So while Pastor Johnson's teaching contains some hopeful insight using Deuteronomy 8.4 and 8.29, I believe, as a definitive promise of divine health, this is going to be an overreach, in my opinion. The Bible does encourage us to pray for healing. I mean, it's several times throughout Scripture. It, it encourages repentance. And, you know, we live in a fallen and broken world. God may choose to miraculously heal or give grace to persevere in illness. Either way, he promises to be with us in our afflictions. While the concept of walking in divine health is encouraging, Scripture does not guarantee freedom from all sickness and disease. Passages used to support this idea often require interpretations that go beyond the text. When examining the full biblical narrative, godly people still experienced illness and affliction. Healing appears centered on God's intervention in response to prayer and repentance, not as an absolute promise. There are plenty of scriptures that support that we live in a fallen world and suffering is inevitable. God may choose to miraculously heal or give strength to persevere. His presence remains with us regardless. So ultimately, we're called to pray boldly for healing, you know, holding on to those scriptures while accepting that God's ways are higher than ours. You know, he has wisdom that's way above what we can ask or think. Humility and faithfulness matters more than perfect health. Now, if this topic resonates with you, I encourage you to subscribe to my podcast and follow me on social media. The links will be in the show notes. Let's keep this conversation going and walk closely with God together. I appreciate you listening. All right, well, that's going to conclude the podcast here, but I want to mention that there's going to be some links in the show notes that you're going to want to check out. One of them is going to be about Gary Nesbitt's miraculous healing, and, you know, he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and God healed him instantly. Okay. 
And in some of the interviews with him, we talk about the sin sickness correlation and we use scripture and talk about ministry where people confessed, repented, and got healed. He has a lot of videos to, with evidence of that. Also, I'm going to include some links for social media so we can talk about walking after the Spirit as a Christian, spiritual Christianity. I'm also going to include a link to my book, Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey. It talks about my experiences before and after being born again and what it's like to actually have your eyes open to the kingdom of God. God bless you. I want to thank you for being in my life. If this has touched you, please share this with your friends and family on social media. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comraderocks.net.